Let's revise the whole of motion in GCSE physics. I'm going to be following the AQA GCSE physics specification. However, as always, the physics is applicable to all exam boards. So let's start off with distance. Now, distance is a scalar quantity. So this means that it has a magnitude, but not a direction. So for instance, if we had a road like this, and let's say that the length of the road along Along this line was I don't know let's say five kilometers then this would be our distance now on the other hand the displacement is a vector quantity now this means that it has both a magnitude so we can write this here magnitude plus a direction now, the displacement is defined as the distance in a particular direction in a straight line from the start point to the end point. What does that mean? So let's say that our start point is here and our end point is here. And in this particular example, the displacement would be a line between the two. So the displacement is the distance in a particular direction. And in this case, notice that this is at 27 degrees to the horizontal. So we typically tend to express the displacement with an arrow, which is directed at an angle. So we can say that it has a certain length. If this one here is five kilometers, in this case, this will be smaller. Should we just say, for instance, it is, I don't know, three kilometers, for instance, at a 27 degree angle. Here are some trick questions. So for instance, if I was to start here, so let's say that this here is position one, then I go across and then I do some sort of loops, then I come back to position one, then this means that my displacement is zero. And now let's talk about the difference between speed and velocity. So speed is a scalar quantity, meaning that it has a magnitude, but no direction. For instance, we can say that the speed is, should we say 30 meters per second, but we don't know in what direction that is. On the other hand, if we say that the velocity is 30 meters per second, horizontally to the, to the right, then we know both the magnitude, which is this bit here, and the direction, which in this case is to the right. It can also be at an angle, so it could be across here at, I don't know, 60 degrees, etc. And it's typically represented with a vector. But it has both a magnitude and a direction. Now you need to recall for the exam some typical values for the walking, running and cycling speeds. So walking is around uh, one and a half meters per second. So if you think of something like a meter stick, it's like one and a half of them. Running will be three meters per second and cycling, it will be about six meters per second. Notice as well that the typical value for the speed of sound is around 330 meters per second, but this can vary depending on air pressure. So the speed of sound and wind will actually be varying depending on the air conditions. Whenever the speed is actually a constant, the equation that we use is that distance is equal to speed times time. If we were to write this symbolically, we'll just write that S is equal to V multiplied by T, where the distance is S, the speed is typically given with the letter V, and the time, of course, with T. So the distance is typically measured in meters, that is the standard unit for it. The speed would be measured in meters per second and the time would be measured in seconds. Now here's one really interesting example. If I have circular motion, so if I have a circle, and let's say that uh, something is moving in a circle, so maybe there's a person we're looking from above and they're swinging something over a piece of string with some center. Okay, well, we can have a situation in which the speed is constant, so we can say that the speed is constant, 
but the velocity will be changing. The velocity is changing. Now this is strange. The reason why we can have the speed being constant is because the magnitude of the motion remains the same, but the direction is changing. So we can just say here that the direction is changing. What do I mean by that? So whenever we have the object, it could be something like uh, a rock on a string or something like that that we're swinging, the direction here is pointing, let's say, north straight upwards, whereas here the vector for the speed is going to be the same size, but now it's pointing fully to the right. Here, the object will be um, this will be moving straight down and here it will be moving fully to the left. So the direction keeps changing, however the magnitude of the speed remains exactly the same. And now let's have a look at distance time graphs. So first of all, if you have an object which is stationary, then the distance s will not change and this will just be represented with a straight line. However, if the object is moving at a constant speed, the graph would be a straight line through the origin. In this distance time graph, we can use the gradient to calculate the speed. So we can plug in those values into our equation for the gradient. And remember, our gradient is however our y-axis changes. So in this case, we're going from 0, 0, the origin, to 5. Therefore, the gradient will be equal to 5 divided by our x-axis goes from 0, which is here, to 10, so it will be 5 over 10, and this here will be equal to our speed, so this will be 0 0.5 meters per second is our speed. Now, the steeper the gradient, the higher the speed, and the less steep the gradient, the lower the speed. So, let's have a look at this yellow line. This one here reaches 5 meters, but in 4 seconds. We can calculate the speed using the gradient again. So, in this case, the speed will just be equal to the gradient. I'm just going to write grad and this is equal to 5 divided by, we're going from 0 to 4, so 5 over 4, which is equal to 1.25 meters per second. Now, just to note that in some cases, you may be given a curve. If you're given a graph which is a curve, and we need to figure out the instantaneous speed, the speed at a given time. So let's say that we want to figure out the speed right across here. The procedure is to draw a tangent. So we need to take our ruler and then draw a tangent to that line. In this case, the tangent would be just about there. And what we would do then is find the gradient of that tangent. So what I would do is literally just draw my gradient triangle on this and pick out some values from the graph. And here's my gradient triangle. In this case, I've not, not really drawn any values because I wanted to just show you the method. But once again, if your if you need to figure out the speed on a curve, you draw a tangent to that point and you find the gradient of that. Now, let's talk about acceleration next. So, acceleration is defined as the change in velocity per unit time. Mathematically, we can say that A is equal to delta V, where delta V is just our change in velocity over the time that's elapsed, which is t. 
So the units of acceleration are actually meters per second per second. And we tend to write that as m divided by seconds squared. The units of velocity are just meters per second. Then we're dividing by seconds again. So the units of time are just seconds. If the acceleration is opposite to the direction of motion, so for instance, you can have a car. Uh, let's see if I can draw a car real quickly. And this car, let's say, is slowing down. So it could be mo moving this way. So the speed and the entire motion is to the right. However, if it's slowing down, maybe there's an obstacle or something up ahead, it needs to slow down before this point it will be uh, accelerating in the opposite direction. Now we tend to call this deceleration. In fact, a good rule of thumb to remember is that if an object is slowing down, then we call this deceleration. So the gradient in a velocity time graph is actually the acceleration. So we can write over here that the gradient is equal to the acceleration in a v against t graph. In this case, our gradient will be equal to change in y over change in x as always. So our y-axis changes by 30 meters per second and our x-axis changes by 20 meters per second. So 30 over 20, that's just equal to 1.5 meters per second. Now, if the gradient was higher, i.e. if the line was steeper, this would be an indication that it will have a higher gradient. So let's draw a steeper line across here. This yellow line has a much higher acceleration. On the other hand, if we had a object that was moving at a constant velocity, then the graph will just be a flat line. So let's say that this red object here will be moving at a constant velocity. And we can just write that here. So this here is constant velocity. The yellow one has a higher acceleration is going higher a and this gray one has a lower acceleration which is equal to 1.5 meters per second because we've just calculated that one more thing to note is that the area underneath a velocity time graph is actually equal to the distance that has been traveled by the object. So in this case here, this is the distance. And we can usually calculate that with a triangle. Should we just make some numbers up? So let's just say that the speed has increased to, I don't know, five meters per second. And let's say that this happened in um, two seconds. So we can say that this x-axis here is two. Well, what is the area? That will be the area of a triangle. So the area will be equal to the distance traveled, which is going to be half base times height. Now our base is two multiplied by our height, which is just five. The twos cancel out, leaving us with an area of five meters, which is our distance that was actually traveled. Sometimes we may be given a problem in which we may have to count the individual squares that are inside of the triangle and kind of approximate the distance that was traveled. But these don't come up in exams as often as just simply finding the area uh, if you're doing the higher tier only. So this only appears in the higher tier. Another equation that we need to know about is that final velocity squared take away the initial velocity squared is going to give us two times the acceleration times the distance. Mathematically, we'll write the final velocity as v, which is just measured in meters per second individually. But in this case, we're squaring it. Then we're taking away our initial speed. 
um, which in this case is written as u typically. So v squared take away u squared will be equal to 2a multiply by the displacement s. So v squared take away u squared is equal to 2 times s. We can use this equation to calculate any of the unknown quantities. If we wanted to rearrange that for any other to for any other of the quantities, we, should we just practice that? So let's say that we want to rearrange for the acceleration. This will be equal to v squared take away u squared, and then we're going to be dividing that by 2s. If we wanted to rearrange that for the distance, the formula will become v squared take away u squared divided by 2a. Please note that this formula only applies for constant acceleration, so this, only, this is only true if the acceleration is not changing. So this is really, really important, particularly if you decide to do A-level physics later on. Now, talking about acceleration, you also need to know that the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth is on average around 9.8 meters per second per second. Now, this is an average value around the Earth. If an object is falling, though, with the effects of air resistance, it will experience a very interesting motion. So, as the object falls through the air, initially the acceleration is constant because there's not a lot of air resistance. And, uh, in fact, we can even draw a little graph of... Um, the motion of the object, which is, should we just draw a velocity against time graph for this type of motion. Okay, so here is our graph, and the way we're going to draw that is we're going to imagine something, maybe we've just dropped this object off an airplane. Initially, the acceleration is going to be constant, more or less, because air resistance has not really kicked in. And there's only one force which is acting straight down, and this is the force of the weight acting straight downwards. Now, as air resistance essentially picks up, there's going to be another force, drag, which will be constantly growing. And as it picks up, the gradient of this graph will start to be decreasing and decreasing. Let's see if I can draw a curve on, on my tablet. And then at some point, the object will be at terminal velocity, the maximum speed that it can reach. And during that exact time, the drag will be equal to the weight. So we can say that at terminal velocity, the drag is going to equal to the, to the weight. And when that happens, we are going to be moving at a constant velocity across here. So right over here, we can say that this here is at terminal velocity. In this region here, we have decreasing speed or decreasing acceleration, a little bit more accurate, so decreasing acceleration. The speed is not actually decreasing, but just the acceleration. And here we have a constant acceleration. So if you go skydiving, for instance, you would experience a similar curve. So initially you'll be accelerating really fast and then as the drag kicks in, that will slow down and then you will be moving at terminal velocity before the parachute opens. 
Okay guys, well done, you have covered the whole of motion. What you need to do next is start revising waves and this is a really, really important video that will make sure that you get that nine in GCSE physics and have a click right over here.